we're going to embark upon a series of classes to discuss the yoga teachings of Jesus Christ. And I'm going to approach this so we all understand from the perspective of the teachings of Paramahansa Yogananda, what he taught and what he shared, and also what was uh, explained also to me by my teacher, Swami Kriyananda, of the teachings of Paramahansa Yogananda. And I'd like to begin today's class as an introduction, because this is a very vast subject. Hardly can we encompass this in probably a year's worth of classes. Uh, we could cover many different aspects, but what I'd like to do, because it's the Christmas season, we're now in the month of December, I'd like to limit this first series of classes to maybe five, six, seven into the month of January, which point I'm personally, I'm going to then be traveling back to India and be engaged there. And then a little bit later on in the 2023, we'll come back and as we start to approach the Easter season, it's then appropriate again to pick up these classes and I'll continue again with another series of classes at that time. Those two major Christian holidays in the year, uh, I say Christian in the sense of all of us being true Christians in the deepest sense of the meaning of that word, that uh, the Christmas, the birth of Christ, and of course is passing with his his crucifixion and ultimately the resurrection. Now, as I say, this is a large, uh, large topic. And I want to start by first explaining a little bit about Jesus Christ, because it's important for us if we are going to understand what uh, Master was speaking about, and I relate, I refer to Paramahansa Yogananda's Master, we must have an understanding of the context of which Christ's life is set. Christ came with a mission. Paramahansa Yogananda explained that, that Christ, Jesus Christ was an avatar with, who came to this world with a mission, but Paramahansa Yogananda incorporated the teachings of Christ as part of his mission. And he said that his mission in this, his incarnation that he came into was to show the underlying unity of the message of the East, as represented by Bhagavan Krishna through the scripture of the Bhagavad Gita, and of the West, specifically the teachings of Jesus Christ is through the Bible. This was part of his larger mission to, in this age, to bring together East and West, to break down those barriers and to go deeper into the uh, not just the outward teachings that we see on the surface in the Bible or even in the Bhagavad Gita, but to go behind it. What's the unifying message that is universal in those two teachings? And once he was asked, somebody asked him, uh, why are you focus on the Bible and why are you focusing on the Bhagavad Gita so, show, trying to show the unity of those two scriptures? And he answered very simply, he says, because that is what Babaji, the great Mahavatar and instigator of this line of gurus, that is what Babaji asked me to do. And he made reference that these two religious traditions as represented by the teachings of the East through the Bhagavad Gita and the West through the, the Bible, particularly the Jesus' life in the New Testament. He says they're both true scriptures. And he wanted to show that unity. Now, somebody asked him, well, what makes them a true scripture as, a, as you know, a true religion, you, know, you could say, as opposed to others? Why don't you include others? And he said, well, a true religion is a teaching that teaches the ultimate destiny of the soul is moksha, liberation. That this is this is what would you could define a true teaching that gives us the avenue, the path, the techniques to be able to accomplish that. And this was the message of Jesus Christ. And of course, it was the message of uh, Bhagavan Krishna in the Bhagavad Gita. And so Jesus then, for that reason, and for another very important reason, was are is included in the line of masters of this path of 
yoga as elucidated by Paramahansa Yogananda. And this other major reason was he said, if we read the autobiography, Paramahansa Yogananda explains that Jesus Christ appeared to Babaji and requested, made a special request that Babaji send someone to revive the true teachings of the Bible. And that someone, of course, was Paramahansa Yogananda, that he then, through Babaji, through Lahiri Mahashai, through Swami Sri Yukteswar, trained Paramahansa Yogananda to be the one to be sent to the West to show the unity of this religion, which is very important, would be very important in this particular age in which we as as a global community have entered into this era of Dwapara, as it's called in the East, this era of Dwapara Yuga, that we are entering, the world at large is entering a new age, and that he was bringing Yogananda into this new age, a new expression of religion. Swami Kriyananda it was who asked Yogananda, is this a new religion that you're bringing? at this time he said oh no no sanatan dharma there's no new religion there's only one true religion that's sanatan dharma he says but it expresses new and freshly in every age and so consequently he was he was bringing out we had since we had transferred into a new age he was bringing through his teachings a new expression of that ancient religion that would be appropriate for this age techniques that would be appropriate for this age techniques would help us have a living experience of the teachings of Christ, the living teachings of the ancient masters of the East. And this being an important element of this new age, experience over merely formality, ritual, scripture, belief only, we must actually experience in this age. And he included, because of his of Jesus' appearance to Babaji, included Christ and put his picture on the altar. He says he was he's in our line of masters because it's this world mission that we see it very, you know, we see this historical trend in very short term, one lifetime, two lifetimes, or historically in a in a century or two. But this is something that we must understand. It's a larger from a larger perspective, the perspective of the masters, ages pass. And there is a historical trend. And Babaji, as he said in the autobiography of Yogi, is guiding Babaji and Christ together, are guiding the unfoldment of spirituality in the world, particularly in this age. And so Christ is part of our line of masters. And he said, as Master did, he said that to his disciples, he taught techniques very similar to what we teach in this line, particularly the teach of yoga or the teachings of Kriya Yoga uh, in particular, that this was something that is underneath and informs the teachings of Christ in the Bible, as recorded at least in the Bible. Now we must understand that this tradition of Jesus Christ come down, comes down to us through a few scriptures only, the apostles, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, that are accepted uh, as, as, uh, as true accounts. This is the basis for Christ's life. But obviously, there must have been much, much more. The tides of history have covered them up, you might say, that time passes and we have just this glimpse. But that glimpse alone can, is, has been able to create a worldwide religion, a worldwide movement, and affect the liberation of countless number of souls in the past and also in years to come, especially when we see it on a deeper level. So we have to understand, to set the, let's set the scene for this uh, coming of a great master. Jesus Christ was a liberated soul, as we'll explain later uh, in, in, in in one of the future classes, he was a came as a liberated soul, an avatar, and he 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 too came to bring in his time a new expression. Jewish prophets or prophets who had come up through the Jewish tradition had appeared many times in that ancient tradition. In uh, Yogananda said that actually even 
uh, you could say the founder of the Jewish uh, mosaic tradition was Moses himself, who was a great master in his time, perhaps, what was that, 800 years or so before the appearance of Jesus Christ. And many a times in as the centuries passed, Moses' law, Moses' teachings was rejected by the Jewish people. But again and again, great prophets would arise and to bring the Jewish people back to that ancient tradition. God is one. And God, you could say, in, we say in, in India, all is Brahman. This is what the essential message also was of Moses, Brahman. God is, there's one God. And in the sense, all is of that one God. And But again and again, mankind drifts and makes their religion other. You shall have no other God before me, was the commandment. In other words, not a necessarily an idol alone, but even in its modern age, what is our God? What is our religion? Is that which we give our heart to, that which we worship? Could be many things beside God. God takes the form of money, pleasure, you know, all the outward things that we make our, you might say, make an idol of them and make that our religion. And they take, they, you could say, they break that one commandment, thou shalt have only one God before me, uh, no other God before me. And Christ came at a time, centuries later, predicted in the Old Testament, the Testament that Christ would come as a savior, a redeemer, the Messiah. And he came not to overturn the law. He came again, coming back to that phrase I used earlier, to offer a new expression of the ancient tradition. He didn't come. He said, and the quote, there's a quote in uh, Matthew, the, uh, the first gospel. He says, do not think that I have come to abolish the law of the prophets or the prophets. I have not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. For truly, I say to you, until heaven and earth pass away, not an iota nor a dot will pass from the law until all is accomplished. And so he came, he, made, he declared that he'd come to fulfill the law. But of course, only a, only a few accepted him as that, but he emphasized and his new expression, you could say, was not to overturn what had gone before him, but to, you might say, act as a corrective, to include the uh, something greater than that. You shall love the God, you shall love the Lord, your God, with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind with all your energy, with all your spirit. This is the greatest and the first commandment, as he said. And like unto it, you shall love thy neighbor as thyself. And this basically summed up the message he introduced into the, the Mosaic tradition of that time, the element of, of reminding, not that it was absent, but had it been overshadowed by outward form, to be reminded them that there is the letter of the law. Yes, the le the law itself has its has its expression, but there's also the spirit of the law. And if without the spirit, the letter of the law is dead. We must have that spirit. And who he came at a time to introduce, reintroduce, you might say even that spirit into the times. But he had come. We must understand he had come at a time when as our tradition says, in the middle of a very dark age, Dwapara Yuga, Yuga. no, 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 <laughs> Kali Yuga, we've entered Dwapara now, but they had descended out of Dwapara Yuga into that Kali Yuga. And what is the characteristics of Kali Yuga? It's a focus upon rigidity, form, the physical, as opposed to the, the subtle, and so consequently, scripture, the letter of the law, takes precedent over the spirit of the law. Ritual takes precedent over direct experience. Ceremony in, in an outward form takes precedent over something within. And the intellect 
the mind takes precedent over intuition. And uh, this you see expressed. And he came at that in a very dark age, not to, you could say, not to reinforce those, but to introduce this other element as a corrective, you might say, we must reawaken the spirit. This, as he says again, is my commandment that ye love one another as I have loved you, to bring that spirit. And from that spirit, then we can interpret the outer forms that we need to have. But without the spirit, the forms become dead. And so another element, of course, we have to understand is when we look at the tradition, he, he brought that, and but he also, there was, what his life had the power to do was to change others. He brought a great magnetism. And this is, of course, something that only a great avatar, a great master can do is to be able to transmit that power into the world at large. People gravitated to him. They were inspired. There was something new about him. He awoke something within the people of his time. But of course, to a certain degree, maybe to a large degree even people what the words they heard of his preaching it stirred their heart but it's the human it's the human temperament the human tendency then to translate that into some outer expression that they understand and so it was that jesus ran into that obstacle as well and ultimately he was rejected by the, most of the people in power, at least of his society at that time, and he's ultimately resurrected. When we come next in the next series of classes later next year, we'll talk about more about his resurrection. And but I'll, I'll say at this point that it had a tremendous impact upon the spread of his message. There was the testimony of his disciples, a testimony that of those who had known him and the testimony of his resurrection electrified the people that heard about it it was something that appealed to that uh the the notion of godhood at that time and had a tremendous impact and slowly his message of his life his parables the stories he told the uh, the impact of the of the spirit over the form it had a great appeal, particularly to those who are, you might say, on the lower strata of society at that time. We're not invested outwardly, you might say, into the the wealth or, or the power or the position that were held by uh, the priesthood at that time. And it began to spread. He had made a testimony that his 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 what he, his life demonstrated was a truth that could change lives and it did change lives and it began to spread at that time throughout the mediterranean after his crucifixion we must understand that the, the jewish community that was in israel at that time had outposts of believers in that tradition throughout the mediterranean mediterranean there were enclaves of jewish people throughout the Mediterranean. And at first, it particularly began to spread in those individual small communities. But ultimately, it spread beyond those communities into the Gentile, or say the non-Jewish community began to spread. But that message that is embodied in the story of St. Anthony of the desert a few centuries later, who was a hermit, who lived to be probably 100 years old and spent almost all of it in seclusion out in the desert. And there was a time when the Jewish or the Christian, the new awakening Christian tradition was spreading throughout the Mediterranean at that time. And a certain schisms began to form in terms of who was Christ? What was he? Was he just a man? Was he a great teacher? Or was he God himself? All of these theological questions began to arise. And the local bishop in Egypt of Alexandria at that time uh, 
didn't know how to answer and he was trying to solve the question and bring people together and he called Anthony out from the desert went far out into the desert found him because he knew of him and he knew of his wisdom and his enlightenment and he called Anthony in to Alexandria to resolve the issue and very reluctantly Anthony agreed but, but he was uh, obedient you could say to his superior the bishop there and he went and he didn't say but a few words he gathered before a large gathering to testify from his own personal experience and he said four words now maybe later he said more but at that occasion this his story is passed down to us he said four words he said i have seen him in other words christ was a living reality to anthony and actually appeared to him in form and of course, it silenced the crowd and brought them together into this message of Christianity that was being spread at that time. He said, you know, um, and like uh, coming back to that theme of it was a new expression. He said, yes, we should uphold scripture. And I say this because I don't want to have people think that it doesn't have its importance. It does. It sets a foundation for us. He said then Christ himself, Jesus himself and his teachings said, yes, we should uphold scripture. We should pray. We should go to the temple. We should do all of these things. We should abide by the law, both the worldly law and the higher law. But all this is hollow if we don't have a living relationship with God. And that's, of course, what Anthony had. And, and the saints that, especially in the early church, there were many great saints that arose who had that living relationship with God. And that message has been passed down from to us as well. That is the foundation of a spiritual life, is to have a living relationship with God. And it comes through our direct experience. And this is the this was the teaching of Christ. And this also is the teaching for us. He's two millennia later. He says, come to the Father, love God. And again, one of his quotes, the kingdom of God is near. Repent of one's sins. Realize that. Now, how the audience took that and what Jesus himself meant are quite two different things often. People can only understand at the level of their own, you could say, awakening. And the kingdom of God is near. And so naturally, people interpreted this. Unfortunately, many people did, actually. They interpreted, they saw Christ as the Messiah. The, you could say the, the, uh, the one who was in an earthly sense, the one who would come and lead his flock back to the kingdom of God. Now, you can understand that if on an outward way, come back in a worldly sense, the king of the Jews, as he was proclaimed, would in a mocking sense at his, at his crucifixion, had come back, but not in the outward form that so many people of the Jewish tradition at that time were hoping. They were being oppressed by the Romans at that time. It was a colony of Rome. And there was a movement amongst the local people that we must rebel we must reclaim this kingdom and what we need is a leader to as in the time of the old prophets to arise and drive out this invader and this is what many were seeking and christ came and he was seen as that messiah that one who would lead the jews to an earthly kingdom but that was not to be he came for a spiritual reason he came to lead people to that kingdom within. And so we said the kingdom of God is near. He meant it in the sense that the kingdom of God is within all of us. And this is the message that his disciples understood, but this is not necessarily what other people in, in, in what his audience understood, and perhaps not even really what his, all of his disciples understood. I, it's often said that he was betrayed by Judas Iscariot, one of his 12 disciples, who obviously had to be a very spiritually 
advanced person to be included in that company of apostles. But he didn't understand. And the theory, many say, that he expected Jesus to rise up and declare his earthly kingdom as well. And when he didn't, he was disappointed in that. And you could say he sold out Jesus in the hope that he would rise up and meet that challenge outwardly. But he totally misunderstood. And this was, a, if it was for one of his close disciples to have that misunderstanding, obviously that misunderstanding was probably there to a large degree amongst the general populace as well. And of course, this was very, very threatening, not only to the Romans, but it was also very threatening to the Jewish hierarchy, the priests who were invested in the status quo of that time. But when he said the kingdom of God is near, what would you think? If you were to say, well, that if, especially if you saw that in worldly terms and that misunderstanding, of course, carried through Jesus's life and ultimately led, perhaps contributed at least to his ultimate crucifixion and death. But when he said they didn't understand, he, and he said also, there's a quote in, in one of the gospels, he says, neither shall they say lo here or lo there, for behold, the kingdom of God is within you. Now that was a radical thought. The kingdom of God is within you. And he was obviously, he was referring to something else. And that phrase has been passed down for all the, the couple thousand years since it. And I was reading an interesting commentary. I think we as yogis, as meditators, who peop, uh, those are students who have a, you might say a little broader understanding of what he was speaking about, the kingdom of God is within each one of us. Each one of us is trying to find that inner kingdom. We meditate, we practice in order to go within, to discover that inner kingdom that awaits our, our discovery of that. And we can understand that in these modern terms, but not all. I was reading a commentary uh, a week or so ago about uh, how Christian theologians today interpret that and they, they don't see it in the same way. The kingdom of God is within each one of us. And there was a quote I wrote here. He says uh, about one fellow, he says, one modern translation of this is saying, the kingdom of God is in your midst. You know, in other words, not within you, but it's the kingdom of God is in your midst. In other words, I am the king. Jesus was saying, I am the king. Uh, uh, proclaiming Jesus himself is the king of that kingdom, which in a spiritual sense could be true. And this one commentary was saying, uh, he said, uh, quoting him, he says, uh, Jesus was surely not saying that the kingdom of God resided in the hearts of the Pharisees. Well, and he says, and he, so he was obviously he was speaking about some other kingdom and of uh, the kingdom of the Christian church, perhaps the king of the Christian church. But we would understand it. I'd say it's yes, he was speaking about the kingdom of God resided within the Pharisees as well. The Pharisees, the Romans, everybody's hearts, the kingdom of God is in our hearts. And to see this in that greater perspective is something that all of us need to come to understand. Christ is within you. Christ is within me. Christ was in the Pharisees. Christ was in in the Romans. But when he's used the word Christ, he was not speaking of himself as Jesus. The, he was speaking of himself as Jesus the Christ, because Christ means something much broader than he personally. And this is one of the basic confusions that we will encounter as we begin to study the life of Jesus, we begin to study the life of his message. He often taught, and he didn't clarify it, he was speaking to an audience that didn't have the subtle understanding of what his message was. And he often taught through parables, he taught through stories. And when you have a parable and a story, it can be interpreted in many, in many ways, and, and, less, and especially so if we don't understand the context of the times in which those stories are told. And so, he, as I said, he was born into a very Jewish tradition, 
had it passed down from uh, from the Mosaic tradition that was eight centuries prior to his time. And it was into this culture that he was born. And they had prophesied that a Messiah would come. Now, a Messiah, you could say, is understood. It's a, it's a savior, a savior of corn. And he came as he was asked, are you the Messiah? And he, he acknowledged it. I am. I'm the Redeemer. He was saying, he was saying, he was, he was saying, I am the Redeemer. But when he said, I, this is where we must understand in this case, and also through many instances in the Bible, he, I was not he, Jesus, but that in which he embodied in his consciousness, the Christ consciousness, the Kutashta consciousness, as we would say from an Indian perspective, this super consciousness of which he was identified. Christ, just to clarify, uh, in literally means the anointed one. And he was the anointed. Now, he was the anointed, uh, you could, as it was outwardly understood, he was anointed as the son of the King David, you know, had, that had been prophesied by the Bible to one day redeem the kingdom. But anointed also is he had bathed himself in his inner realization into the consciousness, the super consciousness of God. And he had attained that state of consciousness, which is known as we term it as the Christ consciousness, the Krishna consciousness, the Kutashta consciousness. He had attained that level of awakening. And he, through that attainment, was the embodiment of that state of consciousness. And so he often would speak of himself in the Bible as the son of God. And other as as, uh, as and when we say those words, the son of God, it means something very different than in a literal sense. Now people took it in a very literal sense, but only a few really understood it in the mystical sense. The son of God has come to redeem souls, the Christ consciousness he was speaking about, his state of the Christ consciousness has come to redeem souls. When we, each of us individually, when we can attain that state of the Christ consciousness within ourselves, we are redeemed, we are uplifted, we, are, we transcend the state of ego consciousness within ourselves. We attain that state of freedom when we can attain that inner state of Christ consciousness. And so in this way, when he was speaking of himself as the embodiment of Christ consciousness, I am the way, I am the truth. He is speaking from that level. No one comes to the Father except through me, as he said. And that's literal, you would say, that has been taken by the Christian tradition in the century since that no one comes, you cannot find God except through me, Jesus Christ, this personality, this historical figure. But obviously that can't be true. What about all those millions of people that preceded Christ in his that time? What about those millions of people that have not ever even heard of Jesus Christ or in the ages to come? Is one historical figure, one body going to be that I that he was speaking of? Obviously not, doesn't make any sense. But he says, no one comes through the Father except through me. If we interpret that in the broader sense, no one comes to the Heavenly Father, the ultimate cosmic consciousness, except through me as the Christ consciousness, that state that we must attain if we are to attain our own liberation, if we are to attain moksha. There is a process, a step-by-step -step process through which the soul descended into this world of Maya must reclaim and retrace our steps back to God. And we can go in, we'll go into that a little bit. So if you were, it's a mistake, unfortunately, as the, as the many Christian traditions have taken this route to interpret that phrase, no one comes to the Father except through me, to mean I, Jesus of Nazareth, that one unique soul, am eternally unique and only through devotion to me in that form 
can you attain everlasting freedom? This makes no sense. Now, I think it makes no sense, but obviously a lot of people do think it makes sense and have passed this tradition down ever since his time. But Master said, Yogananda said, Christ was crucified once, but his teachings are crucified by millions every Sunday because they don't understand the deeper meaning, the transcendental meaning that applies to every soul, whether they're Christian, Hindu, Muslim, whatever it might be. He was speaking of something much, much deeper, much, much universal when he made those statements. And this is the message that Paramahansa Yogananda came to clarify that message, to universalize that message, to bring out the deeper truth of that message. He was referring to his identification with Christ's consciousness. The son of man he would use as a phrase when he was speaking about that personality, Jesus. So you'd see these two phrases, son of God, son of man in the Bible. And remember, when he spoke of the son of man, he was speaking about that incarnation as Jesus. Now, a carpenter, you might say if that is from Nazareth, but I don't, we'll talk about that a little more later. It, there's a very distinct difference he was making between I and my father are one. It's that deeper, uh, that deeper reality. Now, these are mystical truths that we're speaking about. And he represented some deep mystical principles, which it's important for us to understand if we're going to understand his message and what he was speaking and what about and what he was trying to convey. This idea of the of the Father, the Son, and ultimately the Holy Ghost, as it's spoken about, the the, uh, the Trinity, how this relates to the larger message that he was speaking about, and then next week I'd like to explain that a little bit, and I also then from there will go down into his life, into and especially this time of year, the birth, his birth in this world as an avatar the star of the east that tradition his early life and we'll then from there we'll talk about his baptism by the great prophet john the baptist and the, what that represents historically and the deeper meaning of those incidents in his life as we go forward in this discussion inevitably you're going to have questions and um <laughs> probably too many questions. But nevertheless, if you do have some burning questions, I would like to take time as we proceed to give each of you, now those of you who are interested, a chance to ask those questions. And please do, then keeping them to the topic, of course. Uh, I won't have opened it up to questions this week because I wanted to just get us started. But next week, I'll, I'll speak of those topics I just mentioned. And then at the end, we'll, I'll try to give uh, 15 minutes or so of time for questions. And we'll proceed this way week by week through the Christmas season, through into the early New Year, and uh, until we get to a convenient po point to uh, temporarily halt the discussion uh, as to allow me to go to India and do a few other things uh, <laughs> to be able to share these teachings with people there at that point. And then as I said earlier, we'll revisit this, uh, this story and these, this uh, very broad subject when it comes closer to the time of Easter. So for this week, let's stop here. We'll pause here. We'll come back, begin next week with a very short discussion of uh, the Holy Trinity, which it must be understood because when we speak of the Christ consciousness, we have to understand is with that he was a manifestation of that Christ consciousness, as are all avatars. They're Christ in manif or they're God in manifestation, which is the essence of what the Christ consciousness is about. So let's come back next week and thank you for joining us this week. And I, I think it should be a very enjoyable and uh, enlightening journey that we've embarked upon. God bless all of you.